very happy to have here Anne Applebaum, uh, who is the columnist at Washington Post and an expert on post-communist transition. Anne is running Transition Forum at the Legatum Institute in English and is a famous intellectual explaining a lot, a lot, a lot about what's happening in this part of the world uh, for many years, but especially now. So welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. As always, we're happy to have you here and we have a few questions. So having a champion explainer is a good one. Um, especially as we're seeing the pressure in Russia kind of build up, you know, you had this adventure in Ukraine and now you have a new one in Syria. How is Putin keeping control of the Russian populace? What sort of tools is he using there? Is there anything new going on or is it old trends being built up on? I should first of all say this question of old and new is a complicated one. Um, Putin and the people around him are people who were trained and educated by the KGB. And so, so that's old. That's, that's old. That's their mentality. That's where they're coming from. That's the, you, know, you, can, you can see it in how they see the world. Um, many of the techniques they now use, um, however, are new and more, more sophisticated, actually, than, than, than the old-fashioned um, you know, the old-fashioned forms of media control and social control that, that the Soviet Union used. So Russia is really a very different place now. Um, but you know, if we just speak about media, um, you, of course, in, you know, in Ukraine know this better than anybody, but um, the, the way in which Putin manipulates the media is, again, both new and old. So it, nowadays there isn't one Pravda or one television channel saying the same thing over here, the Soviet Union is good. Now you have a dozen of them. They sound different. They argue with each other sometimes. Um, you know, new television channels, entertainment channels, newspapers, websites. Um, but they, but about 95% of them stay within a single narrative. So although they are different and they sound different and different people work at them, they, they underline the same points over and over again. And this is echoed also in social media and it's echoed um, in politicians' statements. And you can, you know, I, I can always tell from my Twitter account what is the Russian line of this week or this month because it begins to be repeated repeated by people commenting. People come around. out of nowhere. And it gets people repeated. come out of nowhere. And so, and so, so I mean, that's sort of a new version of the party line coming down, where before right. it was in the party paper, now right. it's through these different sources, but works right. out to be the right. same. Right, right. Well, and, and, you know, the Syria thing has been interesting. You know, even you, the com you know, until recently, the, the, you know, the Russian line was all about Ukraine. You, the Ukrainians are Nazis. We need to form again an anti-fascist coalition to fight against the Ukrainians. Um, you know, we're saving our Russian brothers in Ukraine. You know, these are the kinds of lines you would hear. Now there's been a shift. And now what you're hearing is, um, you know, the West is degenerate. It's no longer able to, to, to do anything in the Middle East. Russia is going to show the way and lead the world by doing something decisive. And you actually hear, have heard this echoed um, in the last few weeks by um, some of the people who, who – some even European politicians who sometimes echo what Putin says. So they'll say things like – um, uh, you know, Ukraine isn't important. What we really, you know, we need to focus on Syria. And, you know, the real crisis facing Russia is refugees, not Ukraine, not Russia. So, in other words, he's trying to shift the argument so that now we're talking about Russia as a country which is in the center of international debate and we need Russia in the Middle East and so on. But is this assertion, is it just preposterous? Because you see the same arguments being used, you know, arguments about Orthodox tradition in terms of religion, mm -hmm. argument about Nazis. You know, in front of the UN, you had Putin and talking about the coalition created to fight Hitler, and now a new coalition needed to be created to fight ISIS. And is just, this just pushing propaganda to the breaking point, or does this have you know, some treads to it? No, I mean, I think there's some logic to it. Um, you know, and I think that there are people who are willing to listen to it and are willing to, to pick up on it. And I'm, I'm sure that his calculation is that it will work inside Russia. Um, you know, inside Russia, where incidentally the Ukraine war was beginning to be was beginning to lose traction. People were less interested in it. The number television watching numbers were down. Um, also, Putin wasn't really winning in Ukraine, or at least not in the way he wanted to win. But that is and a so question. now he's changed the subject, and he's you know moved. You know, now the only thing on Russian television is Syria. At the same time, there, are, there is a lot of uh, debates and like, has Putin won? What's your answer on that? Depends what you mean by win. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, to use an Americanism. But um, it, it, so no, he didn't, he didn't win in, the, in his original idea, in the original idea of creating Novorossiya, breaking mm -hmm. off all of eastern Ukraine, creating a new state, something like Transnistria. No, he did not succeed in doing that. I think what happened was is that he believed his own propaganda and he didn't believe you know, he, did, he did believe that you know, anybody who spoke Russian in eastern Ukraine wasn't a Ukrainian. They were a Russian. And so they really would 
you know, come out on the streets and cheer when Russian soldiers came. But if came you in. get the ball rolling and then that's it would kind of go that by itself. That was what itself. he thought would happen. Yeah. That didn't happen. And Ukrainians did fight back, you know, for better or for worse. Um, and, you know, he didn't expect to have any opposition, and he did. And so he, he failed everywhere except sort of in Donetsk and Luhansk, but at a huge cost. And so that was not the idea that he wanted. So, no, he didn't succeed in creating Novorossiya. Um, of course, what he did do was he destabilized eastern Ukraine, and, of course, he can continue to do that, as you I, I don't have to tell you, in, in many other ways. And uh, before we go into that, I also encourage you to ask uh, questions in our Twitter. Also, you would, can address a question to Anne. Um, so she might answer, uh, being here live in Kyiv. And with this um, inner disturbance also, because it's a different stage of the conflict. Uh, I mean, there was an occupation of Crimea, later there was a full-scale war in the east of Ukraine. Now it looks different, a frozen conflict, wherever you uh, call it. So um, what do you see the, are the other tools of influence at, that, at this moment? Well, the frozen conflict can obviously be revived at any time. So that's, you know, it's always there. You know it. You know, it can always be, it can always be created, recreated again. I mean, for, you know, it's not an accident that it went quiet just as the Syria crisis began, because the conflict depends on how much the Russians want it to be there. So it's their conflict. Um, they have economic tools in Ukraine. Um, they have, you know, media tools in Ukraine. They have agents of influence, which is a fancy way of saying, you know, people who, who either are on the payroll or who are, you know, interested in, 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 in helping them achieve things, in, in particular Ukrainian businesses or industries, but also in, in the Ukrainian government. So they have, you know, there are many ways in which they can attempt to manipulate um, what happens in Ukraine, even if they even if the conflict remains frozen for a period of time. I mean, you know, even the most obvious, you know, boycotts, you know, the gas, um, agricultural boycotts, you know, there, there are plenty of things they can do to, to damage the Ukrainian economy. And there are levers to work all of that. There are levers. I want to mm -hmm. pivot slightly just to talk about the EU. I mean, we've seen a lot of efforts by Putin to try and divide Europe um, mm -hmm. and to try and to break them apart, uh, in mm -hmm. particular in terms of far-right governments. Yeah, I think, um, by the way, that's his main foreign policy goal, more important than Ukraine. Okay. Is Europe so dividing it? To, to divide Europe. To, uh, you know, I mean, it's very ambitious, and maybe he probably can't do it, but he can do damage, which is to divide Europe, divide NATO, you know, and eventually get the Americans to leave. I mean, I think that's the, that's the, that's the big goal. Well, to hollow out these institutions. To which hollow is out the institutions, which do. are in trouble anyway. So, yes. And that's what I wanted to ask about, because when we look at the migrant crisis, you know, that puts these European organizations under great and greater stress in governments. I mean, what sort of, how do, do these crises help Putin when there's something larger that then something like the EU is having difficulty confronting? Does that aid him? Well, I think crises in the West are very useful for him. Um, I think the refugee crisis has been very important for him. It's good for the right-wing parties that he supports and that are pro-Russian, mm -hmm. uh, pro-Putinist. I shouldn't say pro-Russian in, in the EU. Um, it creates, um, you know, a sense of dissatisfaction in the EU. You know, European institutions seem unable to deal with this, which is true. They, they are unable to deal with it. Um, and so it, 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 it adds to his, you know, and it also, as I said, we've heard these arguments, I think, um, you know, if, if, if memory serves, we've heard them from President Zeman in the Czech Republic, who said, you know, this refugee crisis is what's really important. Russia, you know, this conflict with Russia needs to be put aside so that we can resolve this refugee crisis together. And Viktor Orban has said something like that as well. So, so you know, he, it, it, it enables people who, um, who, who may have their own issues with the EU also to... to, to when it's trying to change the conversation in another way, it's saying, let's, you know, let's not talk about Ukraine, let's not talk about that, let's talk about refugees. Yes. These are people who didn't want to have the conversation about Russia yes. to begin with. Yes. And now the story with this, um, you know, where the conversation is. Um, it's a lot about populism, but also it's a lot about this relativism, you know, that everybody is equally bad, everybody has its own agenda. So that was something different. You're corrupt. Which we, you're corrupt. Yeah. Right. But um, that's what we've discussed. Um, how it's working, is it really that there is this huge distrust in Europe um, regarding also their governments and how it's not just about the Russia. That's what we feel also when um, we talk as Ukrainians to many people in different European countries, that there is this kind of a huge distrust everywhere to the governments and uh, who are acting currently in the European Union, in the UK, in Poland, in Hungary, in the United States. So how um, that 
that everybody is corrupt. You know, when the Ukrainians are coming and explaining, you know, we had a corrupt president, so like our, ours are not uh, even a bit better. Um, so what impact that kind of change of discussion has to the... Well, so there, you've, you just asked sort of several things at once. I mean, so yes, there has been a, a Russian line, um, and I, you know, I've heard it several times from senior Russians, you know, myself, which is, okay, I admit, you know, we have corruption. Maybe even Putin is corrupt. But you're also corrupt, and you're corrupt in exactly the same way. And there's no moral difference between you and us. And the West and Russia are really the same. And there isn't any, you know, there's no distinction to be made between them. And so you might as well trade with us anyway. So stop talking about it. And that's a line that they use, which I think is designed mostly to work inside Russia, um, to, to, you know, to convince Russians there's no alternative. Like, okay, maybe this system isn't perfect, but believe me, you won't find anything better anywhere else. Um, when it appeals it, to that built-in cynicism, and it as appeals well. to this, this kind of post-Soviet cynicism, um, and but but the, but the second issue is, you know, yes, there is something else happening um, in Western Europe and the United States, I would say, which is. Um, partly to do with the breakdown of a, of a not, not so much mainstream media, but a mainstream political dialogue. You know, you're beginning to have sort of media communities that don't speak to each other. So, you know, a right wing and a left wing, which not only disagree about, you know, what we should do about um, the transportation system, but they don't actually even agree what the problem is. There's no, there's no joint narrative. Um, and that makes it very hard to do any kind of political deals or make compromises if you don't e even agree what the story is. If one group is watching one television station and reading one set of internet media and the other one is doing the other. And you have this, and this is now true all over Western Europe, not just all over Europe and the United States. And this makes, uh, this is making, you know, it's creating um, difficulty for democracy and it's creating a difficult, it's sort of, um, creating a lot of distrust towards the government and towards, particularly if you're in one narrative and you don't understand the point of view of the other, it's making people have more difficulty speaking to each other. Um, if to um, try to be concise with all this, also I'm asking very general questions, but still, you were arguing that there is no real strategy uh, toward this region, towards Ukraine, Russia, um, uh, by the European Union and by the West. Is it somewhere there? Has it appeared uh, by this stage? So there are pieces of it, um, and there are, um, you know, there are people who are beginning to have a strategy. Um, it's an unusually bad moment, and you know, we're at an unusually bad moment in the American political cycle because Obama is reaching the end of his administration. He's not able to, um, to, he, he's not going to do anything dramatic. Well, he's a lame duck year. president. He's a lame duck president already, very early actually. Um, we don't know yet who's going to follow him and what their policy will be. Um, you have the weakest president in French history that anybody can ever remember, who also seems unable to take um, clear decisions. Um, you have a, a British government which is the most inward-looking and most divided also, not, not divided, but most inward-looking and most obsessed with its own domestic problems of any British government I can remember. Um, and so you have, you know, so all that leaves Germany. Um, and Germany is a country which is uniquely badly equipped to be a foreign policy leader. You know, it hasn't been one since the war. It's, ta it's always taken its lead, you know, from Britain and France or from the United States or from NATO or from the EU. And it doesn't have, it's not used to thinking of itself as a leader and as of the country that forms the long-term foreign policy but strategy. But why is that? Is it just because it can't take military action or is it It can't take military that? action, but it's, it's also, it's, it's, the Germans are unaccustomed to thinking of themselves as the leader of Europe. I know that sounds strange because everybody else thinks they are, but mm. they have, you know, they've, they've felt comfortable doing it econom in economics for a right. long time. You know, that's sort of their area. But, you know, defense strategy, um, you know, big international relations questions, that was, that's what the U.S. did for them, you know, through NATO or through something else. Or that's what, that was done, you know, the Mrs. Thatcher or, or Mitterrand, you know, these were the leaders um, uh, of Europe. And the Germans were always somewhat a little bit behind. And they don't even, they don't really even have a way of thinking institutionally about it. Um, well, from what it, you're saying, though, then it sounds like there's a power vacuum in Western there is a power leadership. Vacuum. There is an, I am saying that. 
There is a power vacuum. <laughs> There's a power vacuum. You have. It's just. I mean, even 10 years ago, there was a more cohesive. You know, in some ways, it's luck. I mean, it's mm -hmm. to do with who are the leaders of these particular countries at this moment. But, and I once was listening to the President Tusk, President of the European Commission, who said uh, it was regarding the different kinds of crises in, in Europe, that currently the intellectuals, uh, they all speaking about the fr problems and the issues that the governments have, but are not really proposing also any kind of vision. Mm. Uh, so, of course, there are the leaders, there is a vacuum of power, but the intellectuals just, you know, more more or less, give an assessment, it is, but don't propose anything. So what would well, be the, 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 your the, the, idea? the visions require are dangerous. I mean, so my vision would be that Europe should begin to have a, you know, have to begin to have its own foreign and security strategy, and that it should see, you know, your, its sphere of, um, its sphere of activity as Eastern Europe and North Africa. And it should think in terms of, you know, spreading stability into those regions. And it should take them seriously, you know, that it's, you know, Ukraine, um, uh, Ukraine, I mean, perhaps one day Moldova, perhaps one day Georgia, um, and, you know, you know, Tunisia and the other countries with whom it's possible to cooperate in North Africa, and begin like, to take mm -hmm. them seriously, support stability there. Work, you, know, the, the, you know, after the bombardment of Libya, and believe me, I went to Libya three times, there was no, you know, there was, there was no serious European effort to help promote stability in Libya. Lessons that had been learned in other places following other civil wars were not applied. You know, people, the, the, the government of Gaddafi fell and then everybody left. Mm -hmm. Um, which is exactly what we did in Afghanistan after the after the after the Russians left. It's exactly what's happened in several other places. But it's, it's just like when nobody yeah. learns the lessons of of, uh, of the past. But what is it? Because it seems like part of it is fundamentally not wanting to think of things in terms of influence. You know, Russia saw Ukraine in terms of Western influence expanding, mm. and the EU didn't even have that much interest. They no. were worried about them trying to join and get larger. So I mean, with is a that, few exceptions. In with the a EU. few exceptions, okay. Mm. But I mean, what does that create? Especially as you're mentioning, in many of these countries, it means people take some action and then disappear. Here. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what it means. That there's a little bit done, and then somebody gets distracted by something else, and you know there's a there's a little small effort made, um, and then and then you know people forget, or people are, are afraid to put too many eggs in one basket. I mean, I've heard it argued about Ukraine. Um, I heard this argument in Washington. You know, we didn't want to put too much money in Ukraine because probably it will all be wasted. And it will all disappear, and it will be, you know, it will be stolen, and um, you know they're going to be taken over by the Russians again anyway, eventually. So why are we putting any effort into it? I mean, that's a, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's kind of a, you know, there's a sort of, there's the also fatalism. another thing happening, which is important post Iraq in particular. There is a, there's a real lack of confidence in many Western capitals, even about our ability to do useful things in other countries. I mean, I don't, I'm not even talking about military intervention, but, you know, even our ability to help to be stabilize or our ability to promote democracy. You know, we have a, we had a lot of confidence after 1989, and that's really disappeared. I, you know, another thing, uh, you know, during the, particularly the beginning of the Syrian crisis, I had a lot of Syrians ask me, you know, why doesn't the United States help us? You know, there are moderate Syrians. You know, there are Syrians who want democracy. Why don't, why don't you help us? Is it because you don't like Syria? And I said, no, no, it has nothing to do with that. Um, it's because the, nobody in the West, and people said this to me in London or Washington, nobody had the confidence that we know what to do. There was no... There was no sense that, you know, we, here's what our policy is. So, so there really, created, there's been no policy in yeah. Syria at all since but what's the war the, where is this crisis of confidence coming from? Is it from the Afghan it's war, from the Iraq war? Partly, where? Yes, partly it's from the Iraq war, and partly it's from the economic crisis, which sort of dented the West's confidence in its, its own system. And what are the answers to that? You know, just, we again can sit and discuss how bad the things are, but then somebody has to create the vision. Somebody has to. Well, you know, I mean, I, you know, I can, I can create a vision for you, and I can put it on, on paper, but I need someone to enact it. I mean, what, what we do need is, to, is, is political leaders who are willing to, you know, take these risks. And it's, you know, by, by taking a risk like that, it's very easy to lose your job or, you know. A and, and you mentioned all this discussion um, in the U.S. from uh, about Ukraine. So the money would be wasted and all the mm. things. We also discussed that it would be a kind of a Marshall plan to Ukraine could work and probably this IMF package. It's not exactly what it is, but this is a substantial support. It's, a big, it's big, the IMF package, actually. And uh, so, um, and your uh, assessment of that, so uh, you said you've 
it's over exaggerated. It's exaggerated this discussion that the money anyway would be wa wasted mm -hmm. and Ukraine would be in the Russian sphere of influence. But from the way you follow what's happening here, um, do you think it's like that? And what are the no, risks? I, no. So uh, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm not here all the time, and I'm not reporting here. So I don't. No. I'm not going to tell you what to think about the country that you know much better than I do. But um, no, it's clear to me that there are people and there are institutions which can be funded in Ukraine, um, and there are business opportunities. And I know it because I have friends in Poland and London who are interested in investing here. And so there is. You know, they're, they're clearly, you know, as you, as you were saying to me before, before we started, you know, this is not the same kind of government as we had three years ago. Um, it's not a perfect government, but there are, th there are clearly things that have changed, and there's clearly an effort being made. And it's, it's, you know, it's possible to, you know, if you try, you can find, um, you know, you can find places to invest. So, so, so no, I don't think it will all be wasted. And from the from your experience following the reforms after different kind of during the times of transition in Eastern Europe, so what are still the biggest risks apart from a general world corruption? I mean, generally speaking, as I understand it, and this is not I haven't spent a lot of time studying you know the legal system in Ukraine. I mean, I think you have a you know, you have a you have one set of problems, which is to do with administrative regulation and the diffi you know difficulties. You know, a lot of corruption can be eliminated by just eliminating by simplifying the law. You know, if you sim if you have very simple laws, then it's hard to twist them. Um, having a very simple tax system, you know, having a very simple um, VAT system, even if you have that at all, but simplifying legislation and making life easier for both ordinary people and for businesses eliminates a lot of corruption immediately. You know, because you don't need to, you don't need a bureaucrat to, to help you do something. You can just do it. So that's, you know, that's one very obvious, um, you know, that's one, that's one obvious thing to do. And the second thing is, um, you know, second thing would be privatization in a in a way that I mean nobody is ever really happy with the results of privatization. But um, taking as much, you know, taking as much, um, pro you know, property and industry out of state hands, um, and f you know, find, finding a way to privatize in a, you know, that doesn't that doesn't wind up in that's not oligarchization once again. Um, that would be really important. Uh, really important thing to do. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and giving us some more insight. So I'm always Over. really delighted to be here. Thank you very much. And yeah, thanks. And uh, probably would, you would learn more while being in Ukraine and probably see it with your own eyes. <laughs> that sometimes matters.